Hello, in this video we will examine the geometric interpretations of the orthogonal diagonalization of symmetric matrices and also the singular value decomposition of m by n real matrices. So this uh, basic talk has been already done in class, but this will just be there for your reference or if you want to rewatch things, kind of slow things down, that type of a thing. Okay, so we know that if I give you a n by n symmetric matrix A, you can always find an orthogonal matrix P and a diagonal matrix D such that A is equal to P times D times P transpose. Okay. Further, we know that this P matrix uh, will be the inverse of P transpose, and we know that the D matrix contains the eigenvalues on D, or eigenvalues of A on its diagonal. So let's just briefly examine what uh, orthogonal diagonalization looks like in two dimensions. So here I have a bunch of different uh, videos we'll go through or animations we'll go through. We'll start with this. Here I see some stuff going on in R2. In particular, this point in the middle is the origin. Uh, here I have the unit circle. So this is kind of the standard ball in R2. And here on these magenta curves, I see the E1 and E2 standard bases. In addition to this, I have some underlying random or semi-random matrix that's been chosen, and I have these two red lines here representing the eigenvectors of that linear transform. In addition to this, I just pick some random vector x just to kind of demonstrate what happens there. So if I go through and want to try to geometrically interpret this, basically what we want to do is we're first to examine ax, the first thing I need to do is examine what this thing does to x. Okay, so orthogonal matrices are basically a coordinate transform, right? I have x written in my standard coordinates. Explicitly, I have this written in the standard coordinates given by the magenta. And after I apply this P transpose map, what ends up happening is I'm rewriting my bases upon which I'm using for R2 to simply be the basis of these eigenvectors. Okay, so physically doing this transform is basically doing some type of higher dimensional rotation, potentially, of R2 to end up with a new setup where the red vectors will be pointing in my x and y direction. So if I do this, I'm running it here, and we end up with this. So you could kind of notice something weird happened. The circle got smaller and that then got bigger again. And that's because in this case, I wasn't doing a straight standard rotation uh, when I was multiplying by that v sub t. I was doing a kind of rotation and flipping one of the vectors. Just to kind of be explicit here, if I wanted to transform from, say, let's see if that's bigger, from, say, these two bases vectors to new bases vectors, one of them pointing in the opposite direction of the original and the second one pointing in the same direction here. So if I wanted to kind of think geometrically, how do I rotate from the red to the black? Well, basically I need to take this vector here and rotate it in the third dimension. Kind of, it'll appear that it's getting smaller and then it'll appear like it's growing, right? So just imagine taking a piece of paper and flipping it around so that you can invert the direction that the red arrow is pointing. That's basically what happened here. Okay. So now what do I want to do? So now I want to apply this D uh, matrix to it. Well, what would D do within this new coordinate system? D is simply going to stretch this curve, right? So it's going to make it potentially longer in the X direction, could be smaller, and then longer in the Y direction, could be smaller. So if I hit enter, it'll animate kind of these intermediary steps, and you can see the X direction was stretched uh, going from zero to two instead of zero to one, and the y direction was left unchanged. So this is because the eigenvalues corresponding to the eigenvectors, in this case, were two for this direction and one for this direction. If I had different eigenvalues, I'll end up with different stretchings. Okay, finally, now that I've done this stretching, I need to apply this final operation P. And doing the final operation P basically is going to do that higher dimensional rotation, but in the opposite direction. So if I animate it, you'll see it'll get smaller, bigger again. And now I've fully applied my A matrix, right? So I know that this whole thing is equal to AX. 
So this resulting picture is what A would do to that original circle. So this is the basic idea of orthogonal diagonalization, at least in two dimensions, that we basically change our bases by doing some weird type of rotation. Within that new bases, we simply stretch in the x and y direction, and then finally we rotate back. So now the next natural kind of thing to ask is, hey, I can do it in two dimensions, but I also know I can do this in arbitrarily many dimensions. Geometrically, what, what are we really doing there? So we can't easily visualize doing it in four higher dimensions, but we can easily visualize it in 3D. So this is the exact same thing that we had before, but in 3D. So instead of a circle, I have a ball. Instead of drawing in the vectors, it's kind of hard to see them with the ball unless you kind of make it transparent, etc. So we're just going to talk about what happens to the ball now. So the first thing I need to do is, again, I need to apply this uh, P transpose X map, right? So we need to apply this. So if I go to apply it, I just rotate the ball. Yep. So now you can see that the coloring, the location of the colors has changed. And that's because I fixed the color map in the background to stay constant no matter how I do these rotations. So the top here, this kind of red color here, corresponded to the original top of the ball. Okay, so now that I did this, I need to do my stretching, right? My stretching in D. And it turns out it's kind of hard to see the stretching if you do it in arbitrary 3D space, right? So what we're going to do is instead of viewing this in 3D space, we're basically going to take kind of uh, two snapshots, an XY snapshot and a YZ snapshot. So here we go. This is my Z axis. This is my Y axis. So that's part of the ball here. And here's my X axis and Y axis. That's another snapshot of the ball. So if I wanted to, I could go in here and rotate it. You see, hey, we still have the ball. But within this viewpoint, we can see independently what's happening in these two coordinate directions. Okay. So doing my stretching, you can see I literally am taking a ball and stretching it in these kind of coordinate directions. So if I put all these together, I'm doing this weird stretching of the full ball. Like both of these are literally the same ball, just plotted on different axes with different aspect ratios. So if I hit enter, here is our full 3D ball in all its stretched glory. And notice that the stretching, it's kind of hard to see, but the stretching, again, is only in the X, Y, and Z directions. There's no kind of shearing stretching going on. Okay, that's similar to what we saw before. Once we got to this point where we applied D is I had an ellipse where I just stretched things out. Finally, I need to apply this last P transform again. And doing that will allow me to rotate back into my standard, um, the standard bases that I originally started out with. Okay, so here, just doing that, I do the stretching, rotate it back, and now I have my A times this ball, uh, A times this ball being represented by A times all the vectors in that standard ball in R3, simply being this little ellipsoid shaped thing, which is given by the same thing as this U, D, V transpose. Again, here, my U and V are just going to be the same matrix P in this case. Okay, so all of that is quite nice, but it's very strictly limited, right? We can only orthogonally diagonalize a matrix if that matrix is symmetric, but we know there's lots of matrices that are not symmetric. So it turns out in general, this is kind of fragile, right? Uh, but if we allow ourselves to generalize the concepts of what it means to be a diagonal matrix and uh, what it means to be an eigenvalue, eigenvector, all kinds of nice things that we'll be doing in class this week, uh, what we can then do is generalize this concept to all matrices, non-symmetric, symmetric, doesn't matter, square matrices or non-square matrices that also doesn't matter. And the way that we do this is we replace basically everything. So what we can do is we can rewrite this as, well, this P we're now just going to call B. It's still going to be an orth orthogonal base, or the orthogonal matrix, nothing really changes there. D is going to be replaced with sigma. Now sigma is still going to be a diagonal matrix, but again, it's kind of a different beast. And we're going to replace the V over here with U, which will be a different uh, orthogonal matrix, okay? So here, the dimension of V, this would be N times N, 
well, given that a is m times n. The dimension of this, that's going to be m times n, and the dimension here is going to be m times n, or sorry, m. So you can see pretty clearly that these matrices, the U matrix and the V matrix, will differ if A is not a square matrix, pretty clearly, right? Further, if A isn't symmetric, we can still do this type of transform, but uh, U and V will be different purely because we can't orthogonally diagonalize a symmetric matrix. Now, for the sigma, the sigma take, plays the same role as our diagonal matrix before, but it's now kind of a diagonal matrix that's not necessarily square. Again, we'll formally define those things in class, but let's just look at an example of doing this type of decomposition for the cases of a two by three matrix and a three by two matrix. Okay, so we'll start with the three by two matrix just because the domain's a little bit easier, and then we'll examine the higher dimensional case, oh, different dimensional case. Okay, so here we're just going to visualize this starting with 2D. So since I'm starting with 2D, I could start with the circle. It turns out that just filling in the circle and talking about the whole disk makes the visualization here a little bit easier. So again, just like before, the first thing that we do is we have to apply this V to some matrix or some vector X, right? So here I'm going to compute this guy. So that does exactly what it did before, it's just a rotation. So here, uh, just to kind of be explicit, I picked the coloring scheme such that the color that gets filled in here is the X value of that vector, okay? So yellow is all the way to the right, blue is all the way to the left in the original plot. So I'm gonna rotate this, right? So again, uh, generally speaking, kind of have a 50-50 chance with the way the code's built of either just doing a pure rotation or flipping it in this case, we had to flip it because uh, one of the vectors, well, one coordinate system's left-handed, the other one's right-handed. Okay, so from here, uh, we've done our rotation. That's what V does. So the next thing that we want to do is apply this sigma. Okay, so sigma now does a couple things. It does some stretching, but it also embeds what we have into a higher dimensional space, right? Sigma, in this case, is two, uh, three by two, so it takes a vector in R2 and it outputs a vector in R3, right? So what's going to happen is in my animation, I'm just going to first do the stretching. So here's my stretching. This is no longer in R2, even though it appears like it. This is now something in R3. To be explicit, it's a subset of R3. And here we go. I can kind of rotate it around. It's kind of an uninteresting subset because it's literally on the Z is equal to zero axis. Now, to modify this from here, to be able to map to kind of general mappings in R3, that's where I apply this U matrix. So what the U matrix is now doing, it's rotating this matrix in 3D space. So from here, if I chase this guy out, we rotate it out, and now I have some surface in R3. You can see kind of, it's still flat, right? It's a plane. Uh, and in general, that's what the singular value decomposition of a matrix is telling us matrices do, right? A matrix is literally rotate in the uh, Rn, stretch to some different dimension potentially, and then after we do that stretching, rotate in that uh, higher dimensional or lower dimensional space. In this case, it was higher. In the next example, it will be lower. Okay? So that's literally what any arbitrary matrix you ever see does. Okay, because this uh, breakdown works for all matrices. So now what we're going to do is repeat this exact same thing, but with a going from R3 to R2. Okay, so just cleaning that up. I first want to start with kind of my original space. So again, when chasing out these X vectors, we're just going to plot things on the unit circle, in this case, the unit sphere. So if I run this, do, 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 here we go. There's my unit sphere. Again, kind of have my shading uh, kind of fixed and the shading will be fixed throughout all of this. Okay, so now that I have my kind of starting spot, I want to apply this V transpose to it. So V transpose will just be a uh, orthogonal matrix in R3. So it's just going to do a three dimensional rotation. So da, 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 da. there's my 3D rotation. 
And again, you saw it got smaller and then bigger. That's because this rotation is really doing things in higher dimensional spaces. Like in order to call it a rotation, you need to talk about the higher dimensional spaces. Nevertheless, I changed my bases. Now I have this kind of object to work with. So now I want to apply my sigma. So when I apply my sigma, I've run into the same issue that I had when doing it for the orthogonal diagonalization uh, in R3. It's kind of hard to see what happened. So what we're going to do is split it up into different slices. So I have the x, uh, y slice over here, and I have the y, z slice over here. So now I'm going to do my stretching, but in the act of doing the stretching, I'm going to lose information, right? I'm going to be mapping from R3 to R2. So it's kind of like doing some type of projection thing, but strictly speaking, it's not strictly speaking a projection. Okay, so if I run this, you can see in one of these dimensions, like they're both kind of shrinking, but that one over here, that shrink to zero. So now the object that I'm talking about has no width or height in the z direction, okay? And in the y z direction, it also kind of collapses to a disk because again, it has nothing in the z direction. So to kind of see this, if I come over here and look this out, yeah, it's, it's flat, right? The color mapping kind of does weird things because graphically speaking, I'm taking the top half of the sphere and the bottom half of the sphere where that's well, top and bottom are defined with respect to the transform. I'm taking those two halves and I'm mapping them together. So the color plot kind of freaks out a little bit. Okay, so if I make this explicit, this is now a subset of R2, right? So once I apply the sigma, since uh, my A was a two by three matrix in this case, the sigma will now be mapping to a two dimensional space. And finally, I do rotations here. So let's just kind of visualize doing those rotations, rotate it around, and that's my final object, okay? So in this case, I mapped from R3 to R2, and I'm now a flat disk in R2. So that's literally what we're studying this week. That's geometrically what these mappings are doing. And that is honestly what every single matrix ever does. You can always think of it as rotate in the Rn, where n is the domain of A, or the domain of the linear transform corresponding to A. Do some stretchings, where I might be embedding myself into higher dimensional spaces or lower dimensional spaces. And finally, do some kind of more rotation things. And again, here when I say rotations, I mean changing the bases.